Good afternoon to everybody uh, and welcome to the Atlanta Aero Club webcast, November 19th, 2020, uh, or as some people say, the year of the asterisk. Uh, my name is Steve Champness and I'm president of the Atlanta Aero Club, which is a regional chapter of the National Aeronautics Association based in Washington, DC. We're one of six aero clubs across the country and uh, we have been holding meetings in a in-person basis for 36 years. And this year we've modified our format and increased our visibility by doing it on the internet. And uh, we are really delighted to have uh, Mr. John Lauder with us today from Delta Airlines. And uh, John, thank you for being here, sir. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me, Steve. Well, uh, we're gonna, introduce John formally here in just a moment and uh, just a couple of quick administrative things and and uh, so since it's a lunchtime event like our luncheons used to be we suggest all of you uh, that are joining us today grab a sandwich and a, a coca-cola if you're from Atlanta and get comfortable uh, and, and enjoy the next hour uh, this is going to be a lot of fun and uh, I think you'll you'll find that Delta is an amazing topic I'd also like to point out uh, and give special thanks to our gold sponsor for this year, 2020, our sustaining gold so sponsor, uh, Gulfstream Aerospace uh, Corporation for making this program possible. Uh, and that's a company that all Georgians and all people in the United States can be very proud of the work and the aircraft that they're building that represent us all. I am also a publisher of the Ab Buyer Magazine, which is uh, directed towards the business aviation marketplace. And, uh, and I extend greetings to all the people that we do business with and those watching us uh, from the business aviation community. Uh, our guest speaker today is Mr. John Lauder, as I just mentioned. And uh, I'm gonna read you his biography and it's too much for me to remember, it's so impressive, but uh, this will set the stage for what he has to say. And, and John, if you'll bear with me, uh, John Lauder is Senior Vice President and Chief of Operations of Delta Airlines. He leads the teams responsible for industry leading, safe, reliable operations across the globe with oversight of corporate safety, security, and compliance, flight operations and technical operations as well. John directly oversees Delta Airlines 12,000 plus pilots and its global flying operations support staff with more than 300 professionals who manage pilot staffing, training and standards, technical support and regulatory compliance. John is a longtime safety advocate and previously served as Delta's Senior Vice President Corporate Safety security and compliance. He directed the airline's overall safety, security, quality, and environmental performance and kept focused on Delta's top priority of safety first. A 27 year Delta veteran, John began his career as an aircraft liaison engineer and held various leadership positions within Delta and in the technical operations uh, interiors, engineering, aircraft acquisitions, materials and planning, and ultimately was appointed Senior Vice President Technical Operations. Currently, John chairs the Georgia Tech Aerospace Engineering School Advisory Board and serves as a member of the Delta Flight Museum Board, Atlanta Habitat for Humanity Board, Georgia Tech Flying Club, which I also had the honor to be on with John for a period of time and board of visitors of the Monast Monastery of the Holy Spirit. John holds a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology, Georgia Tech and an MBA from Emory University's Goizeta Business School. John and his wife, Angela, are the proud parents of four sons and reside in Atlanta, Georgia. So that's very impressive and it's a mouthful, but that sets the stage for uh, what John is gonna share with us today. And John, I'm gonna 
ask you, you've had an amazing career with Delta in 27 years. Can you tell us about your journey and uh, what you're seeing now and how things have changed over the course of your career? Well, absolutely. Again, Steve, thank you for having me. And uh, I appreciate the, the warm introduction. Um, I did notice right as you started talking, sometimes it takes sitting here and staring at your, your own video to realize that I've not reset the clock in my office. So please no one hold that against me. Um, that starting off with a technical error in the background. Um, you, you know, I, I have been at Delta. I've been in Atlanta um, essentially my whole life and uh, been at Delta since straight out of Georgia Tech and um, have seen uh, a lot of different, I'll call it eras of the uh, aviation business. You know, you start building um, just, just some, some feel for the different ups and downs and it's a humbling industry as we all know um and and we're in an interesting period now and so i i, I hope to share some of that with you maybe here in the beginning i could just go through a few things uh just about where delta is at the moment but i think you know the the overarching theme is um is just you know the delta customers and the delta people um, are, are who we look to to get through these times. And I think you'll see that evident as we talk more this morning or, th or this afternoon. Yeah, that sounds great. And, and we'd be delighted to hear your thoughts. Uh, you and I have talked earlier this week and, and shared some ideas about this. And, and I know you have uh, 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 some video to share with us today and maybe some PowerPoint information. And, and you let me know when you'd like to get that started. Uh, what, what do you, for you, what has changed the most during your career as you've been going through Delta's ranks and all of these departments that you've moved through in operations and safety? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think the, the industry has changed a lot. I mean, the, um, the industry's gotten better and better over time. Some of the rationalization of capacity, uh, some of the... Um, just I think the airlines overall as an industry running running just better businesses. I you know I'm partial to this one for sure. Uh, you know coming into 2020 um, really at the top in almost every category uh, at Delta, whether it's operational performance or financial performance. Um, you know it it had been a um, a pretty strong decade behind us, and uh, and so I mean I think that's the the biggest change is seeing how this industry continues to evolve going forward. Um, you know, what hasn't changed is uh, here at Delta is there is something different about the people. There's something different about folks that, that come to this company and, and are part of the team and they, they tend to stay here. I mean, I was one that, that entered uh, right out of Georgia Tech and, and probably, um, you know, wasn't sure what I was gonna do. I, I came here because it was a, you know, a good job at 1993 was not a great year to get hired in the aerospace industry. And, uh, and Delta had a position for me and, and I, you know, I took it while I figured things out. Some would say I'm still figuring them out, but at the same time, um, the, you do find that it's a special group of people here. And I, I still, that's the, that's not changed at all in the 27 years. Well, uh, the, uh, things that have happened to this industry, the airline industry over the last eight months have never happened before in the history of this earth. There's never been airlines before, at least not when we had the last uh, pandemic. And uh, as a 35 year customer of Delta, that have, it is Delta has been a big part of my business life. Everyone I know flies the airlines on a regular basis. It's a very normal thing. And we've all gotten very, not just comfortable flying on the airlines because we've been uh, reassured by the uh, convenience and pricing and safety and the high, high standards and quality that Delta and, and all the airlines have. And I think the FAA is to be commended for the jobs that, that they've done too to help make aerospace industry as safe as possible. And so our society in America is the most air mobile society uh, in, the, in the history of the world as well. I hate to use that term over again, but it is. And so for all of us as Delta cu customers, we have been going through withdrawal, if you will, from uh, not being able to interact with, with Delta, our airline partner here in the Southeast area. 
Uh, so as this pandemic broke out for you in March and uh, uh, I guess the end of February and March and April, what was it like at Delta in the, in the you know, with Ed Bastian and you and the, and the management? How did you, you know, I mean, it was incredulous that this was occurring. Did you really, did you have a plan, uh, some sort of backup plan for something that's unimagined? You know, Steve, I, I mentioned it. This industry is incredibly humbling and, and I felt like we had seen it all. You know, I, I was here during 9-11 uh, you, you know, you you watched uh, the days after that where the where the air went silent, uh, no one was flying. Um, but this is like nothing we've ever seen. You you read in my bio part of my journey here has been a, a focused effort on safety, and um, done various business continuity things. Um, but you know the the planning for something like this is difficult to do. It's hard to have this on a shelf. Um, you know, we have various scenarios planned out. What if this happens? This, you know, if you had a problem at this airport, this data center, you know, what if there was, you know, various national crisis uh, scenarios that you could think through. But if you start developing a scenario that says it's going to be a pandemic and it's going to take us down, you know, almost on day one, uh, 90%. Um, you, you know, the planning for that is rough because it, there's just too many what ifs. I mean, is the government going to intervene? Is the, you know, is your, what is your credit outlook? How are you going to make sure that you've got the liquidity you need? And, and I'm speaking, you know, just generally here for the industry. I think, I think this is a tough one to plan through. So it's um, those first few days, um, you, you know, I, I, I think back about it and, and laugh, uh, you, you know, in January, uh, we were sort of looking back over 2019, again, record performance in many categories. Ed went out and kicked off uh, the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. I mean, not a place where you would have said a few years prior, you will see the CEO of an airline come out and talk about innovation and advancement and the things they're going to do. I mean, so, so Ed was uh, uh, fantastic there. And, and we were having a meeting um, early in January where I got a group of people together to talk about what was going on in China. And I can remember the initial briefing sheet that, that we put together just to talk about China and how you know, we need to be prepared for various scenarios in China. And it was, you know, things about what are you, what are we going to allow our crews to do, or, or are we going to provide PPE for flight attendants, things like that. You know, Delta obviously didn't fly to Wuhan, but you, you know, you just needed people to know that we're watching this, we're engaged with the, uh, you know, the government health organizations, and those initial meetings, uh, you know, you are not focused on widespread pandemic. So then, as it started to spread. Um, you know, things got serious uh, quickly and, and, you know, looked at immediate impact and we started seeing changes to our bookings. Um, and it, it, I'll have a chart I'll show you in a minute. It's, it's staggering to see how it fell off, how quickly. Um, but even in the beginning, Steve, you're looking at um, recovery and you're talking about, okay, so, you know, maybe end of summer, you'll, you'll be recovering. You know, you're thinking, much quicker initially, and of course that's an uneducated uh, estimate, you know, maybe a little bit of internal optimism, um, but I have to give it to Ed, Ed, you know, started immediately preparing the company for a longer haul. And that, that'll be something you'll see that, that I mentioned today is, um, you know, this is, this thing yeah, we all know, it, this is going to be a multi-year recovery. It's not when we get, everyone's looking for 2021 and we're not going to get to 2021 and it's magically going to be better. I think it will be improving and we've certainly had our share of good news with various vaccines and things like that. So the outlook is still good. Yeah, the, this past week, uh, you know, some game changers uh, that we discussed just briefly that have occurred in the last 10 days. And that was a Pfizer vaccine announced over 90% effective, since revised to 95% effective. And then two days ago, three days ago, Moderna vaccine, 95% effective. And as part of the uh, warp speed uh, program, an aeronautical term, 
the or Star Trek term, maybe. Uh, there is, should be, if I understand it correctly, they've been producing this vaccine in conjunction with its testing so that if it was approved, it would be immediately available. So between those two companies, we might see uh, some uh, changing conditions and uh, very rapidly as early as the spring. And perhaps that would be uh, what we're hope hoping for, for Delta to be able and for people to be able to resume their normal travel habits and in, in being around other people. It, maybe uh, it would be a good idea to show that video and then we could we could kind of come back to that and some of the things that you're pointing out if you wanted to, to go there now. Yeah, let, I think now's a good time to do that. Let's see if I technologically can make it happen. You can do um, it. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. Uh, here we go. So it does start with a video, Steve. It's about three minutes and it'll give a nice overview. And then, then we'll come back from that and maybe I'll run through just a couple of slides and then we'll pick up our discussion. That's that good? Yep. Okay, here we go. For Delta people, it's always been about going above and beyond to best serve our customers. And while travel may look a little different now, the one thing that hasn't changed through all of this, you can expect the same great service you've always had from Delta. With the introduction of Delta Care Standard, new layers of protection have been added at every step along the journey. Frequent sanitizing of high touch areas throughout the airport and on board before each flight. More space on our aircraft, including blocking middle seats and limiting the number of seats sold, and updated service protocols that keep our customers and employees safe, whether in line at the counter, on board a flight, or between flights in the Delta Sky Club. Delta has really taken the opportunity to evaluate everything we do across our operation. And because of that, we've put more than 100 new safety actions and procedures in place. As always, thanks for choosing Delta Airlines. Hope you enjoy. Safety is always our top priority and something we take great pride in as part of our Delta culture. And that culture revolves around putting ourselves in the shoes of each customer, treating them the way we would want to be treated. We've became family with a lot of our frequent travelers. Hi! All the protocols that Delta wants us to take, it makes us feel safer for ourselves and for our customers. From the small things that make travel more convenient and reduce the number of touch points along the way, to the big things like ensuring the cleanliness and safety of the air on board our aircraft. We're working every day to make the travel experience on Delta the best travel experience anywhere. We're here every day to support our customers, but we're so grateful for the support and trust our customers have put into us. When you board our aircraft and you say thank you for being here today, it means the world to me. We are blocking middle seats, so there will be no one sitting next to you, okay, Mr. Clark? One customer who contacted us, he and his family were supposed to attend a graduation, about six of them. And when he called, he told me he did not want a refund. He said, I want to find a way to apply the value of all six tickets to an employee fund. He literally had me in tears on the phone. How amazing is that, that our customers want to encourage us. With our customers in mind, every department at Delta is going the extra mile, ensuring those customers can continue to fly with confidence. Every day, every employee has their temperature checked, and we have partnered with the Mayo Clinic, CVS, and Quest Diagnostics to develop an effective employee testing program. The Delta Care Standard is our commitment to providing the best travel experience anywhere, not just in enhanced safety protocols, but in scheduling as well. We offer more flexibility when plans change, even making it possible to adjust itineraries on the Fly Delta app. At Delta, we're always committed to providing better and safer service for every customer on every flight. 
I'm looking forward to see those beautiful smiles on our Delta customers. Welcome aboard. We're so glad to see you and look forward to taking good care of you. Thank you for flying Delta. Thank you. Thank you. When you're ready to fly, we are here for you. We look forward to seeing you soon. So uh, let, that's a little bit about our Delta Care standard, and I, I want to talk about that in just a minute, but let's back up and talk about how we started this. And, and this is just a, a line showing um, sort of coming through 2020. Um, you see where we were as an industry. This is more than Delta. This is the U.S. carriers, but it's their global travel, and each line represents a different region. Um, if you can see the, the black line in there, that's uh, that's domestic U.S. Um, and and you can see what I was talking about in March. I mean, I know we all felt it. Everybody felt the sort of shutdown happening in March. Um, but it, you know, I, again, short of a you know, grounding, a national grounding, which we've seen once before, I, I've never seen anything like this. Uh, you know, where the customers decided that there was no travel anymore. And so, you know, coming through the summer to now. We've seen, you know, some change, some incremental uptick. We watched the TSA uh, metric where they they look at uh, total passenger throughput uh, in all our airports. And, you know, we see a little growth and we're encouraged with um, some travel um, planned for the holidays. Of course, the recent spike across the country has slowed, slowed some of that down. Um, the, the reality here is um, we're still sitting about 64% down uh, for all domestic travel and 74% uh, down for um, international. And I'll point out that the top line here uh, is the, this yellow line, that's actually Mexico. So the international number is being uh, pulled up by, uh, by Mexico travel. If you're talking transoceanic, um, that's the still flat line down at the bottom. You know, most of that has gone away, something north of 90% down. So we're continuing to move across the globe and, and we've got a schedule out there and, and where people are allowed to travel, where there's no, you know, they fit whatever the criteria is for international travel restriction. We've got airplanes out there. Most of them are uh, full of cargo and, uh, and, you know, very few people. So, you know, this just gives a picture of what we were talking about a moment ago. Yeah. Is, is this all for uh, passenger travel or does that include cargo? Is there any sort of cargo component to that? The, this, this look here is, uh, is really about passenger travel. passenger travel. So, you know, I mean, the, the cargo story is actually a different story and I'm not equipped to answer with any specifics what's going on at the big cargo carriers, you know, but you certainly have seen uh, a lot of movement and activity at FedEx and UPS. Uh, it's the, the impact to them has not been near, it's a different story altogether is what's happening with passenger travel. So as an industry, uh, you, you know, you think about kind of three streams of things happening here. And one is how we manage the virus and then how, you know, how are we getting uh, traffic and, and revenue back? And then also cash burn. And I'll, I'll start with that just for a second. You know, from the very beginning, I mean, when you saw that line fall off, I mean, our 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 costs of running a, an enterprise with this scale, you know, are significant, significant capital investment, significant operating costs. You can turn off some things uh, quickly, but a lot of things that you can't. And so a uh, lot of focus in the early days and still today on managing cash burn. We are, we're still looking at uh, somewhere out in the first quarter, I believe, to get to cash break even and then start returning to um, building some profitability into next year. And of course, a lot of that, we, we've done so much on the cost side, a lot of that does depend on the revenue returning. And, and of course, that's, that's dependent on when our customers say they're ready to come back, which is what we're working on right now. And kind of the theme of what I talk about here is that our ultimately our customers will decide and we can listen to them and prepare best we can for when they'll be ready to travel. Um, you know, I, we, the, the middle stream here, traffic recovery, um, you know, we have, as this thing has evolved, again, I, I mentioned we look at the TSA sort of total throughput every day. We know what our corporate customers are doing. We're well in touch with them and, 
And you know, while most of them have come back to uh, engaged and they have some people flying, they are nowhere near flying uh, in in large numbers yet. And 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 I think many of you that probably applies for where you work. Uh, certainly, a lot of big Atlanta companies that I I'm in close contact with, they do have people flying on an as needed basis, but they're they're not looking till next year till people start flying uh, uh, on a, a, you know, a broad base again. Um, we have been closely matching our capacity with demand. So, you know, we we can't maintain the footprint that we've had before. We're probably operating around 50% of the operations that we previously did or we did in 2019. Um, and so, you know, that's that's the base from where we start building this thing back as it comes back. And then, and then finally, uh, containing the virus. How we think about the virus, and you know, you, on the one hand, what can what can Delta do about it? But on the other hand, you know, we've got a, a 75,000 employee workforce that we uh, we've we've implemented a testing program with, and and we are identifying people uh, before they get, you know, in close contact with other employees and customers, and and making sure that they're taking care of their health. Um, and then also the things that we're doing to prevent spread of the virus um, on board the aircraft. The, the main thing when we think about recovery is it's multi-year and it's likely to be choppy. As we were coming through this summer, it really started to look like a pretty consistent build. And then you get setbacks, you know, you, you go through a, a, some kind of an increased wave or certain states start picking up again in virus spread. And, uh, and then we take a little turn down. So, you know, it's two steps forward and one step back, and and we'll just keep working through that as this thing comes back. But I think everybody should expect it'll it'll be a little bit choppy. So you, the video was all about the uh, the the um, the new standard at Delta and what we're doing to take care of people. I, I might just start by reminding you, pre-COVID and for since the beginning of time. Um, the purchase drivers for people, why they're choosing is price and schedule. So they choose a flight or an airline or make a decision to go based on does the airline have uh, the, the ticket when they want to go and do they have it at the right price. During this pandemic, the top two purchase drivers are what is the social distancing situation and what is the clean situation on the aircraft? Is the airplane going to be healthy? from a customer perspective. And so that's where we have taken uh, great care and partnered with uh, you know, lots of smart people out there, including the Mayo Clinic and Emory University, uh, Lysol and Purell. So people who are experts in the pandemic, people who are experts in disinfection and cleanliness. And we have put together uh, a program that is like anything in aviation, any safety related program is a series of safety layers. It's never one thing. And so uh, we've got a pretty good program here that really uh, focuses on it's, you know, it's all the things that you know. We, we've got the middle seat blocked and we're going to continue that. I think we just announced that that will be through March. Um, and, and I suspect that, um, you, you know, I will have to reevaluate it and see if it if it's ends in, in March, but our customers will tell us. They'll tell us when it's time to do that, uh, when they're comfortable being that close to other people. You've, you've heard a lot about Delta's mask policy. We require wearing a mask, and um, I think, you know, I've seen varying data, but having a mask on re reduces the transmission uh, of this virus significantly. That's another layer all the cleaning exercise there's a you know a picture down here of the um of the uh the the fogging pr product that we use uh on our aircraft and that is doing a you know a great job of of going beyond just what we can wipe down in the airplane but what you know getting into every uh, crack and crevice um to make sure that we're we're maintaining a much higher level of standard we've built an organization that is focused on global cleanliness and this is not, you know, if you're if you're thinking, wow, you're doing a lot for this pandemic, and it, you know, it may be choppy, but it's going to be gone. I think it's a new um, it's a new expectation of our customers, and so we're building this global clean organization for the long haul, and uh, and so that's for COVID, but that's for beyond COVID. I don't I don't think when COVID is gone, people are suddenly not going to care about 
uh, cleanliness anymore. And, and you know, there'll be another, uh, another virus in the future, and we've got to be ready for that. So uh, the team is doing a nice job. I mentioned testing of Delta employees. Um, you know, the, I think one of the first, if not the, the only um, widespread all employee testing program it's voluntary, by the way, and uh, and the take rate is um, extremely high. Um, and then then a, a data driven approach to come back behind that and look at where are hot spots, how do we, you know, where are people that should be tested more frequently, and make sure that we are um, that all of our layers are effective in protecting our employees. Um, so lots going on here. Uh, I think. You know, this group in particular um, knows uh, a good bit about how the, the filtration system on an aircraft works, but I'll remind you, um, Please. you know, where, where is it? First glance, uh, Steve, I'm sorry, did you say something? No, oh, I, I, I uh, said, please. Yeah, I yeah. know this filtration system is amazing. It, it is. And, you know, I think at first glance, people are like, oh, my gosh, I, I don't want to be trapped in the tube. What if someone in there is sick? Then we're all going to get sick. The reality is, is the way a uh, pressurized aircraft works is um, it's pretty good. It, it actually, you know, forced air in from the outside. It flows vertically, so it's not, you know, blowing nose to tail. It's blowing straight down and then out the side walls. And the beauty of it is about every three minutes, the, the whole cabin air turns over. And so, um, you know, and it's HEPA filtered and things like that. So th the truth is, is that compared to a, a building or a facility, which had, you know, obviously modern buildings have uh, very sophisticated filtration systems, but none of them are turning over the air every three minutes. And so um, it's an advantage that we have here. Um, and, and one that I think that there've been various organizations, there's a, a Harvard study out, um, there's a, um, uh, you know, what, what we've done with uh, Airlines for America in making sure that people know that this is how these systems work. So we're taking credit for it here, calling it Delta state-of-the-art system. Yeah, I, I guess the other airlines have this too, but, uh, you know, it's, um, I think, very important for people to know. I, I don't have any concern, you know, when you think about, is now a good time for me to travel? I say it all depends on where you're going. You know, the travel is down right now, and I think we've we've done a good job at convincing our customers that the airplane is not the problem. So the, the conference that you were going to may not be happening, so you don't have a reason to go, but just where you're trying to go, whether it's for, for business or for pleasure, maybe that's not quite ready for you. Uh, it, that'll be up to you, and again, our customers will decide. I mentioned it, masks are mandatory. Uh, and you may have heard, uh, you know, if you don't wear a mask uh, at Delta, and, and and I don't mean you, it was an accident, you forgot, we'll, we'll provide one for you, or if it you, re you removed it and forgot to put it back on, as long as you're complying with our flight attendants, we'll help you remember. Um, but we've had some people that, as a matter of making a statement, have told us they're not wearing one. And uh, so, you know, we, we, can't, we can't fly you if you're not going to wear it. We tell you up front, and it's part of the deal now. It's the layers of protection. And it's what everyone around you is expecting on board the aircraft. So it's a commitment that we've made. Uh, maybe just a, a, another minute or two here, Steve, and I'll I'll stop talking. But uh, the um, you know a, a couple of good things that are going on. Um, you know, on the fleet, uh, we've got a lot of fleet renewal happening, and uh, and uh, I'll talk about that first. Starting on the left, we we did take this opportunity to accelerate some simplification. So if, if anyone's flown Delta out of Atlanta much, I know you've been on an MD-88 and you know that has its root in the, roots in the DC-9 and it's uh, just quite a success story. It's been the workhorse of the domestic fleet for Delta and it was on its way to retirement and given the pandemic, it was time to just accelerate it. So went ahead and, and accelerated that retirement this summer. Maybe a little more surprising to some is uh, the acceleration of the retirement of our 18777 aircraft. Um, you know, what a what an amazing international capable machine, uh, just a, a beautiful work of art. Um, it's called a pilot's airplane. It's got lots of power um, and people love to fly it. Um, but there's some overlap there with the new um, the new A350 to Delta's fleet. And uh, there was a this was just an opportunity in a time that we needed to uh, simplify and consolidate. 
So that's a couple of, of big changes in our fleet. But, but right behind it is new, and, and just this week we launched our first A220-300. Uh, that's a, um, you know, a, at the smaller end of our aircraft scale, but one that our customers love, and it offers a 25% efficiency uh, on a per seat basis um, to flying. And so sort of uh, good things to come as that fleet continues to grow. We we're have we're uh, of course have been flying the A220-100 for a while now, and this was the first 300. So very exciting. We also accelerated, and I I won't go through all the details, but we've taken this time, even in the midst of cash preservation and all the things that you might think we need to slow down. We've had a number of significant airport projects going on across the system. And you know, those projects are often really challenging um, if you're trying to do them while you're running an operation on the scale that we do. And so you, we saw a real opportunity as the, as the airline scale was dropped down to not only keep working on them, but accelerate them. And so we have recently opened a new terminal in Salt Lake City. I think it's the first major hub airport opening in the last 20 years. And uh, it's a beautiful facility with our new largest sky club in the whole system. Um, and then we've also got significant projects in other cities, Los Angeles, New York, et cetera. So just a lot of, um, a lot of good stuff continuing to happen. Um, and I'll just end with, this is some surveying um, that, the, that the industry is doing just to see, and you know, the three different bars here was an April survey, a June survey, and a September survey. So it's basically, when do you wanna fly? And, uh, and the good news is, is that about 80% of people are saying sometime out in the spring, they feel like they're ready to fly. And, uh, and so, you know, our goal is to be ready for them. What are those things that are important to our customers? And, uh, and, and what um, can we do to make sure that we're executing on that, keeping our commitment and being ready for them? So I think with that, we can, um, we can, I, that's all I wanted to talk about. So let's talk about what you want to talk about. Well, that's, that's, that's a lot to talk about right there, John. I can't imagine having your job and uh, the, the, the sphere, the world of Delta Airlines uh, laid out on your desk every day to look at uh, all the, the pieces of that puzzle and to keep it working so smoothly and uh, so well oiled a machine. I was, uh, I, I encourage anybody that's interested in Delta Airlines to do what I did, which is to cheat and to Wikipedia search Delta Airlines, because there's 32 pages of information that, uh, and it's really a college course. If you uh, wanted to teach this, it's, it goes through the entire history of Delta. And it also talks about the scale, the size of, of what we're talking about that John, it, has to deal with, and, and the, the opening lines of the Wikipedia say, uh, to give you an idea, this probably is a lot of pre-pandemic information, John, but it, it says it was updated in October. Delta Airlines is one of the major airlines of the United States and a legacy carrier headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia, since 1941, I know that. and. Uh, the airline, along with its subsidiaries and regional affiliates, including Delta Connection, operates over 5,400 flights daily and serves 325 destinations in 52 countries on six continents. And Delta is a founding member of the uh, Sky Team Alliance. And then what John just said about Salt Lake City as a hub, Delta, according to this, Delta had has or nine hubs, maybe 10 now, with Atlanta being its largest in terms of total passengers. Number of departures is ranked second amongst the world's largest airlines. And uh, it is Delta Airlines is ranked 69th on the Fortune 500 companies in the stock market. And the company lo slogan is keep climbing, appropriate. Uh, John, when we go back to the fleet for just a minute, uh, something that, that uh, I found out as I was researching a little bit of Delta's history, and I, I, I was thinking that Delta Cargo might be, you know, something that's evolving during this pandemic as, a, as an area of need. And, and I ran across a book, which you might be familiar with, and, and those watching this, this is the book of Delta, 
that was written in 1990. You might have this book. You probably do. And, I did. And, uh, it is really good. Uh, written by R. E. G. Davies Davis, and uh, it is an illustrated guide to Delta. And and I think it was it would be fun to point out that although everybody knows that Delta's uh, fleet is made up of Airbus, Boeing, and Douglas aircraft. Uh, there actually is some aircraft that Delta operated that were built here in Georgia, and one of which was the Lockheed C-130. A lot of people don't know Delta flew C-130s, and I can prove it, actually. This is a, uh, a picture of the, of the Delta Airlines C-130 or L-100, and it turns out that Delta had an air freight specialty, specialist side of the business and operated C-46s, the old commandos they got from China and C-130s and some other interesting aircraft. Uh, and if you look at that book, you'll see a lot of amazing uh, aircraft, dozens and dozens of types and models and makes. And it's come a long way from the, the world's first uh, aerial crop dusting company uh, actually, a lot of people, my friends that work at Delta say it was founded in Monroe, Louisiana, and according to, the, to, to Wikipedia, it was actually founded in Albany, Georgia as a crop dusting company, went to Monroe and came back to Atlanta. So out of 760 aircraft, according to Wikipedia, do you still have about, how many do you have operating now? Is that the information you care to share or is it? Yeah, I mean, I, I I wouldn't want to be quoted on the exact number because there is a lot of in there are a lot of ins and outs right now, but it is something approaching 800 aircraft. Um, I'll tell you, I knew about the L100 from the same book. I had no idea until I saw that book, and I I did want to mention, but I I didn't think I'd get a chance to. Also in that book is the DC7. There'll be a a, a picture of the DC7 in there, and something that was going on here pre-pandemic. Uh, is the Delta Museum, which I'm sure some of you have, have been to. Uh, the museum purchased a previously Delta operated DC-7, which our technical operation divisions, even during COVID, using uh, a lot of volunteer time, uh, just finished painting. It was actually sitting over at e-concourse yesterday. So looking out my window, seeing a DC-7 sitting at the Atlanta airport was pretty cool. And I'm sure it, we'll see if we can get a picture out to you. Well, we, the, the, we've been to the uh, museum, the Delta Museum, and those that are in Atlanta watching this, this is, uh, I believe, the one of the original Delta hangars that was, or it one is. of the original airport hangars from Hartsfield uh, Airport uh, before it expanded so dramatically. And it's a very old hangar, but it, it's got an airplane in there, a special airplane as well on display. You want to tell us about that? Is it a 767 that's in there? It is. The, 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 the uh, ship 102 is a 767-200, and it's called the Spirit of Delta. Um, and, and, you know, I, I started talking about the, you know, the people that make all this uh, look easy are the Delta people and sort of just the, the culture we have here of taking care of each other. And there was a time uh, in the early 80s where, you know, another – bad financial moment um, and Delta employees bought that airplane and gave it to the company. It's uh, it's it's really a cool thing. And, and so when that airplane reached the end of its life, we were able to put it in the museum um, so that, you know, the next generation can see it and see what that contribution was to the company. And so it's something worth coming and seeing if you hadn't seen it before. Well, uh, as being a long time Delta customer, and there's a many other people out there that are million milers and have flown even, you know, many more years than me. And the corporate culture of Delta as a passenger has always been extremely helpful and uh, tre tremendously uh, over the top to go out of the way to help uh, people with, with special needs and any of the issues that you might have while you're traveling. Uh, with an encounter happened to us on one trip when, when the, my companion Nancy fainted and uh, the Delta staff swarmed around. We had medics, we had everybody, and then they got us to the gate. We actually made the flight and uh, it was only due 
to the fact that the Delta employees have the spirit of can do and will do and the total capability and you empower your employees to be able to make decisions without having you know, to, to bump it up five levels to get even you know something resolved. So that, that happened to us. Question a little bit shifting gears uh, for you, uh, John, since I'm in the corporate aviation world a little bit with uh, Ad Buyer Magazine, uh, one of the companies we deal with is called Wheels Up. And did I remember when we had talked to Richard Anderson years ago, he came to a luncheon with uh, Randy Babbitt, who was head of the FAA at the Atlanta Aero Club. And uh, they were sitting together and, and our thought was, you know, maybe something good will happen if we have a uh, Richard Anderson and the head of the FA sitting together, then that, that opens up that line of communication or that friendship. So if there's ever an issue, maybe you get a phone call instead of a letter. And uh, so uh, the, the point is, is that uh, uh, Delta Airlines had uh, executive jets at one time, executive jet division. And, and Richard told me, uh, and he said that he went up to Peachtree Airport and he would catch the executive jets. But you recently sold that. Is that right to wheels up? Or are you still involved in that business? Well, we're, we're actually a minority partner in that business. And uh, so, yes, Delta Private Jets was our, our um, a subsidiary of Delta Airlines that, that operated uh, a, a managed fleet of of jet aircraft and um, and and so the opportunity to partner with a great brand and company like Wheels Up yeah. um, became, became a natural fit and so the two companies put together and I think they're around 300 total aircraft uh, in their fleet and uh, it's just you know it's been a really good match that happened I believe in the beginning of this year right and, and so you are still. Uh, involved in that business to a degree, uh, maybe as a partner with Wheels Up and operate those aircraft? We are. They're a great partner. And, you know, we had done some coordinating, uh, you know, when it was Delta private jets uh, with itineraries between, you know, flying on mainline Delta and then transitioning to Delta private jets. And I'm sure there's still opportunities to jointly market and things like that. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a good company and a good partnership and we're pleased to still be involved with it. There's another division of uh, Delta airlines that when I was refreshing myself and, and I, I, I'm guilty of thinking I knew a lot about Delta airlines prior to our conversation in, uh, today. And I was going through and I realized that when they were talking about Delta technical ops, this, this uh, amazing uh, maintenance and repair and overhaul facility that's located in Atlanta. I didn't realize it was the biggest MRO in North America. It, how is that doing during all of this? We, we know that the engine shop is just state of the art and these engines are so massive, they won't fit under tunnels and trains and, and uh, under underpasses, they have to be flown or floated in many cases to uh, get prepared. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm glad you already know that Delta Tech Ops is um, an amazing business. And, uh, you know, that it's near and dear to my heart. It's where I spent my first 20 years. And, uh, and you know, early on, there was a thought that we're pretty good at this. We could do this for a lot of people, not just Delta. And um, it's been amazing to watch it grow. And, and I'll, I'll, I have to give them full credit. It has done just absolutely the most growth and, and the most advancement uh, since I've been gone. And I, I, I um, left that division seven years ago. And in that time, um, they entered uh, into the state of the art uh, Rolls Royce and Pratt and Whitney uh, power plants, built engine shops that, that could not only build those, but built the largest test cell in the world that could test those engines. We have a test cell um, over at Tech Ops now that can handle an engine up to 150,000 pounds of thrust. That doesn't even exist, but we're ready for it. When there is a 150,000 pound engine, uh, Delta Tech Ops will, will test it. So their, their business is um, just incredible. Very proud of that team and what they've accomplished. I'm, I'm just 
uh, I'm in awe of them. Um, and, and, you know, I think that the, the global aviation business is down and people have taken a lot of the cash preservation um, uh, opportunities that we have. And so they're not immune to that impact, but they've got a core base of customers that continue to march on. And then the partnerships with uh, Rolls-Royce and Pratt & Whitney continue to deliver. Um, and so their business is actually doing very well. That That's an area that uh, is, you know, it's certainly not as, um, it's not taken down as far as what the rest of the airline has done and they're coming back faster, I believe. So great, great business there. Well, you know, we saw the pictures and we had a speaker from uh, Delta Tech Ops about a year ago. And he came and told us and showed us some pictures at the Aero Club and, and, and uh, gave us some statistics. And, and uh, these, uh, these engines are, are massive. And, and uh, I think he said you did uh, overhauled not only all of Delta Airlines internal uh, engines from the fleet, but you're also taking in outside work and uh, doing up to a, maybe close to a thousand engines in a year, which is amazing. Yeah, a absolutely. It is, uh, it is far bigger than Delta Airlines work over there. And as you said, the largest airline MRO in North America. So um, look, it's, uh, it's uh, just a very impressive business. So uh, yesterday, the day before Delta, or it's not Delta, but Boeing uh, aircraft company which has a long and uh, uh, very proud history in, in America and a, and a very key player for Delta with the incredible fleet like Delta had, the Douglas fleet, the, the Boeing fleet, and now the evolution of the Air, Airbus fleet. All of these are wonderful aircraft. And, and uh, they announced the, uh, actually an old Delta guy, Steve Dixon, who's now head of the FAA, and a former F, uh, Aero Club speaker, he uh, evidently they have certified the 737 MAX, which for those watching that may not be familiar with that 737 is the most produced aircraft type in the history of aviation. Uh, and uh, so the 737 MAX was simply the latest mark or model of that with some, some, some changes in air, artificial intelligence AI, if you will. And so did you see that? And what does that, uh, you know, you have a lot of 737s in your fleet. Are you still operating those? We are. So let me clarify. Delta does not operate the MAX. Okay. So we have we have avoided uh, all the impact at Delta of the MAX. And, uh, and but, but I have to tell you, you know, I've had multiple people call me and say, you were geniuses not to buy the MAX. I, it wasn't genius at all. It just worked out that way. Uh, the Max is a great aircraft. It, it's you know you you mentioned the 737 and the legacy of the 737 has just been incredible. And the fact that they can even take it to the next level with the Max is uh, is impressive. And hats off to Boeing for that. I mean the the Max getting ungrounded is outstanding news. Uh, you know I I I'm I'm glad for that. I'm glad for the industry. Um, and, and I'm glad because I know, um, you, you know, and used to work closely with the, the person who's running the FAA now, and I know um, sort of the way his, uh, his uh, safety background is and his thought processes work, I think everybody should have full confidence in the MAX. And, you know, just to remind everybody, there's, it was a technical issue that they were trying to solve. And as I talked about layers of safety and redundancy, it's never one thing. It's a technical issue, and but but it was also a training issue. And so if you know if you if you had a technical problem, you've got to make sure you've got the training so that the pilots are ready to deal with what that uh, issue is. You know, I, I would say it's not one thing. And and so of course they fixed it all. Uh, they fixed all the elements of it, and we're back to the appropriate redundant layers of safety. So. Uh, yeah, it, I, I was pleased to see that. And, it, and it's time. It's, you know, I think it's been 20 months. Uh, I may be wrong about that, but it seems like it's been a while. Well, it's, it's great news for the United States aerospace industry and great news for the aviation industry overall with uh, all of the Boeing employees being uh, getting that cheerful news. And I think it will feel the same way 
when this vaccine comes out and people are uh, returning to Delta in the numbers that uh, will bring you back to where you were. Delta Airlines Simulator Training Division uh, and some of our members include Winston Whit Whitlock, Hend Hendricks Edgerton, Captain Hendricks Edgerton and, and, and others. And, and I know that Delta's uh, training facilities and training division is second to none. It is a state of the art top notch. And you do uh, some of the most uh, robust training in house for Delta and, and uh, is that still ongoing in, in, in the, the Atlanta area? It is, Steve. And, you know, that's a that's a good thing that, to talk about that people may not realize that, you know, if you're shrinking, if and we've done some shrinking, right? We've 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 removed some fleets and we're we're flying about half the operation. Uh, you would think, well, training's probably way down. And we did close the training center for for a few weeks. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, while well, we, we needed to make sure we had the right protocols in place to safely train. Um, but the reality is, is when you're changing in an airline at all, whether you're shrinking, whether you're growing, you are training pilots all the way and pilots moving up and down the, the uh, equipment, moving from right seat to left or left seat to right um, generates a, a lot of training. And so I would say we are, um, we're at full speed here in the training department and, um, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of folks here in the schoolhouse right now. And, and I appreciate you pointing out it's, it's truly second to none. Um, one thing we didn't talk about in my intro is, um, I'm not a Delta pilot. I, I'm a commercial pilot. I have a license and done a lot of, um, you know, general aviation flying in my life, mostly in um, small tail draggers, um, mostly off of grass, very forgiving for my landings. Um, but I did have a chance uh, a, a couple of years ago to go through a, a real Delta pilot training program. And I went through the 777 program, happened to be, that was the one that was available. And, uh, and I, I can tell you with, with authority firsthand, it is second to none just the absolute best instructors, best program, best equipment. Um, and, and it's what I wanted to experience. I wanted to see what our pilots go through when they come through here and um, just outstanding, outstanding folks in there making that happen. Well, I, I am so pleased to hear you're a general aviation pilot like, like myself and, and on my lapel here, I proudly wear uh, my AOPA. Uh, pin 30 years pin and uh, our friends Mark Baker and the rest up in Frederick, Maryland are looking out for our rights as uh, private pilots and, uh, and and we're all in the same family and uh, the airline family and the, the, the general aviation family, we're all in this together, the military aviation family and and there's also another group that I, I'd like to talk about as I can't believe we're, we're getting close to the, to the end of the hour here. And that is the tremendous uh, university system in Georgia and in the Southeast that supports the aviation uh, career uh, programs. And one, of, one you mentioned, we both know Georgia Tech has a robust uh, aeronautical sciences uh, program that you're a graduate of. And then uh, uh, Christopher Blake at the, at the Middle Georgia State University system, which is rapidly growing, expanding, has a phenomenal campus in Eastman, Georgia, that uh, is being run by Aiden Clark, Dean Aiden Clark over there. And he's doing a great job bringing up new people into the, into the system. Uh, and of course, you and I have uh, some common friends, Derek Dennis of uh, ATP, the airline transport professional company that is the largest uh, aircraft or uh, pilot training company in the United States, maybe in the world with over 40 locations and hats off to ATP, hats off to, to Georgia Tech and hats off to Middle Georgia State University. And uh, are, are, is Delta involved with any uh, keeping in touch with those? Do you have a program to, to work with them? We, we do, Steve. And Delta actually started um, in 2018 a program called Propel. And it had a couple of different avenues. You know, one was uh, to help people within in Delta, 
get into the cockpit. And so you have people across the company. I mean, when I started here 27 years ago, I did think about flying and being an airline pilot. That's what I wanted to do when I came here. And so um, we didn't have that program then, but we have it now and it's a structured pathway to get there. The other thing is through our partnerships with universities and we've got uh, eight different universities that we, uh, we partnered with initially and that continues to expand. Um, you mentioned one of those is Middle Georgia State and uh, that's, that's one of the initial ones that we've been working with. And it gives a structured pathway to go from not flying at all to how can I get in the Delta cockpit? And, uh, and you know, it's just, it's through partnerships like that and just the, the great work that people are doing, you know, um, like Middle Georgia State to help us train the next generation of pilots um, in partnership with Delta is, uh, is gonna be what the future is about. We have to remember that there's a shortage of pilots coming, right? And though we don't feel it sitting here right now, um, this will be behind us uh, in, in due time. And we've got to get back to the business of encouraging people to go into flying, to go into airspace in general. And I, I would thank you for all the work that you guys are doing to encourage that. What can we do at the Atlanta Aero Club to help our friends at Delta and especially all of the employees that are affected by this, this pandemic, it, tell us what we can do and we would like to assist any way we can. Well, well, thank you, Steve. That's a great offer. Uh, you know, I would say I walked you through how we're listening to the customers and what we're doing to make sure that the Delta Airlines and airport portion of your journey is safe and that's not something that's going to go away you know when we, we think this virus is behind us that's going to be part of who we are and i would say that you share that with your friends when wherever they're going is uh is safe and ready for you we're going to be standing here ready for you the delta people are going to be ready to take care of you and we appreciate all the support that we've gotten along the way we'll be past this soon john and uh and we all look forward to that. And one of the things I look forward to the most is being able to travel on Delta Airlines and uh, see my colleagues and friends and family again. And I will be back out there as soon as I can. I wanna take this moment, I can't believe that an hour has gone by and uh, it's so quickly and it was so interesting. And John, I thank you, thank you tremendously. And I thank all of your staff Lisa, Bridget, everyone, uh, and, and Ed Bastian and everybody for your uh, wonderful cooperation. Also like to point out that the EWISE Communications Company, uh, especially Joanne Sanders, uh, Justin Mossman, Marjorie Dykes, Taylor Smith, all helped put this together. And the Atlanta Aero Club Board of Directors, John Entignap, Amy Hudnall, Kit Darby, and Elaine Weatherby all provide a lot of support. We thank you uh, very much and uh, uh, want to thank everybody for coming to, and tuning into this webinar. It'll be on our website, Atlanta Aero Club. If you like what we're doing, please join us. It's $55 for a year and you can become a member or sponsor us if you like. John, thank you very much and uh, happy okay. Thanksgiving to all. It was a pleasure, Steve. Thank you for having us. We'll see you next time, everybody. Thanks for coming.